Oh, yeah. As we re- reach back to Long Time Gone by Crosby, Stills, and Nash, uh, that is, again, Long Time Gone, um, really giving that in honor of Laura Waterman Whitstock, who passed a few days ago. So our next guest, we're going to go right into our next guest is Max Wilbert, who is a writer, organizer, and wilderness guide. He's been part of a grassroots political work for nearly 20 years, and he's author of two books and recently forthcoming, um, Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It, which will be published this year by Monkfish. And he's he's uh, authored essays in the Earth Island Journal, Counterpunch, Dissent, Dissident Voice, and translated into several languages it has. And he's involved in both fighting Canadian and Utah star, tar sands and uh, in resisting industrial-scale water extraction and deforestation in Nevada, and advocating for the last remaining wild buffalo in Yellowstone in solidarity work with indigenous communities in British Columbia and in campaigns against sexual violence. So last Friday, Max and a group of activists launched an occupation of a proposed mine, a mine in northern Nevada. Lithium America's Corporation plans to rip to rip, to gouge open 5,000 acres of this land to extract lithium for consumer products. And for more information, including how to join Max and others, please go to protecthackerpass.org. And I want to welcome you back to First Voices Radio, Max. Always uh, interesting to hear what you have to say about the current uh, madness happening. Thank you, Kyokasen. It's really good to be here with you. Yes, let us know about this this mine, this Lithium Americas Corporation, and why you are there and looking to look for this occupation against this mine. Yeah, I'll start off by saying that, you know, when I was a teenager, I thought that electric cars and solar panels were going to save the world. That's what I read, you know, and so when I would hear about the ecological crisis that we're in, in terms of global warming species extinctions, you know, all these uh, things that are a reflection of our lack of harmony with nature. Uh, I I would get scared and I would look for solutions. And the information that was being given to me said that the solution was these type of technologies. And in the years since then, my, I've gotten new information and my position on these issues has completely changed. And the mine project that is proposed for this area right here in northern Nevada, we're close to the Oregon border just north of Winnemucca. The, the, the lithium mine that is proposed for this area would destroy a, a, an incredibly important uh, area of habitat. And so I look at these projects now, I look at these technologies, and I think there's not much difference between this and a mountaintop removal coal mine. This is really the same old business as usual. And uh, it's a case of greenwashing where these companies are trying to, uh, you know, do very good marketing and tell us that these projects are green when in reality, it's just as earth destroying as any other industrial mining project that you can imagine. You would think that because of, of the remoteness that people you know, the, these mining companies and extraction corporations, uh, of course, they deliberately pick this, but they know that it will it will be kind of too little too late before the media or any kind of press picks it up. But your, your venture is to bring it out to people on how delicate even the ecology there is. Would you let us know what we are looking forward to in, 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 in thinking about occupation, but also the education that, that you just told us about when you were a kid, you were so, you know, you were saying, this is, we're, we're going to save the earth by converting to, you know, solar panels and basically lithium to, to save really the, the, the hole that we dug for the lithium and it doesn't make sense to us. So let, let me know about your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that you can save the planet by destroying it. I think that's a contradiction. And this is a, this is an important issue. You know, this place right here is important. I'm, I'm on the phone with you right now. I'm sitting at our camp at about 5,000 feet in Sacker Pass, Nevada, uh, there's a there's big mountain ranges to either side of us, and I'm looking out across 
uh, beautiful old sage, sage, uh, sagebrush. And this land that I'm looking at right now, as I'm on the phone with you, is what would be destroyed for this open pit mine. And this is very important habitat for the sage grouse, the greater sage grouse. They're an animal that has been almost wiped out since colonization. 97 to 99% of them are gone. And this area right here, this, this region, is the best population of sage grouse remaining in the entire state of Nevada. Up, up to 8% of the global population left of these birds lives right in this area. And this mine would destroy critical habitat for them. It would cut off migratory routes for the pronghorn antelope who have been crossing this path for thousands upon thousands of years. It would, uh, it would endanger the Lahontan cutthroat trout, who are a, they're a threatened species of fish who live in the rivers, uh, in the river basin just to the west of us. And the pollution from this mine getting into the groundwater and flowing down into these rivers has the potential to really harm these rare cutthroat trout. And then there's also even an issue of extinction potential because there's a rare species of snail that lives only in freshwater springs in Thacker Pass. Its entire home in the world is 14 springs coming out of the base of these mountains right here behind me as I speak to you. And it can only survive there. Those animals have never been able to be transplanted to another place because they're so perfectly adapted to the springs that they were born in and that they have lived in for generation after generation. And there's a potential that those springs could be, uh, could be dewatered. They could go dry because of this mine because they plan to pump out uh, 850 million gallons of water a year. And that's just in their first stage of mining before they even ramp up and get bigger as they go into their second stage. So there's a lot of issues here. And, and we think this project is not just important for the beings, you know, our kin, our relatives who live here in Thacker Pass, but it's also important symbolically because we're being sold a lie, like I said. And I think it's really important that we examine these issues in depth and, Hopefully, people will come to the conclusion that I have, which is that we can't rely on industrial technology to fix the problems largely caused by industrial technology. Max Wilbert, the land that you are occupying, that the man, that the Canadian developer, Lithium Nevada, um, that land is, is it Paiute, Northern Paiute, or is it Shoshone, Western Shoshone? You know, I'm not sure. I think this territory was occupied by both Northern Paiute and Western Shoshone. I believe in the um, in, in parts of uh, the territory, these groups uh, are rel- you know they're relatives, obviously, and they uh, the uh, the territorial use was was um, concurrent. And um, so this this area, Thacker Pass, was used traditionally by the indigenous peoples of this area. Yes. There's a lot of obsidian here. Uh, we've seen that just walking around the site, and people would come here and gather obsidian and uh, gather food as well. Um, this was a pretty important uh, travel area between the what's now called the, the Quinn River Valley uh, to the east of us and the Kings River Valley to the west of us. So th- there's a long history of occupation and people living in and enjoying this area, and, and that's under threat as well, that, that historical... Uh, that historical site and, and culturally important site. I'm pretty sure Sarah Winnemucca was an ancestor of that area. I think that's why Winnemucca was named after her. I believe she was Paiute. But the Canadian Lithium Nevada developer, Lithium Nevada, has, has this plan, and it really sounds nice, that they will make for a carbon-neutral open pit mine operation in service to a larger green community, a hungry economy for lithium and uh, can you straighten that sentence out for me absolutely you know if you look in the planning documents submitted to the government for their permit the mining company says outright that they will be burning over 11,000 gallons of diesel fuel every single day and that's just at the mine site that's just right here that doesn't include processing facilities and fuel that would be burned elsewhere, which is another more than 10,000 gallons of diesel fuel a day. Uh, 
you know, the second point that I think is very important is the key ingredient in their process. They're going to dig up the earth. They plan to dig up the earth unless we stop them. And they have to refine the, the, the soil into lithium because it's only present in very, very tiny quantities scattered throughout the soil here. And to do that, they plan to use a huge amount of sulfuric acid. And their source of sulfur to make the sulfuric acid is waste from oil refineries. So I think those two facts, the fuel consumption and the fact that they're completely reliant on a a product coming out of oil refineries for their process, tells you that any claims that this is a green mine or a carbon neutral mine are just lies. They're deceptions designed to help market this project and sell it to people and make them think that it is green because it's a lot easier to you know, bypass resistance and get people to go along with a project like this if you can pretend that it's not going to harm the planet. But that's not true. I want to make sure that people know that this lithium is in demand for the electric vehicle batteries, cars and energy storage systems, large and small. So we're talking from the little batteries to the, the, you know, the cars. And I want to do understand also that the mine is promising as, as it does everywhere it goes that these jobs and uh, that they will last for at least a third of them will last for 46 years of this life of life of the project. And as you mentioned earlier, 14 springs were going to, you know, um, basically the aquifer in that area. And maybe there hasn't been enough study or, or understanding of that. With, with your research, Max Wilbert and Will Falk, who is also camped with you at the mindset, you're working to get others to join you. What would make people want to come out to this cold, high desert area in Nevada? <laughs> yeah, I got to say, we're a little crazy to be camping up here in January. But, you know, it's incredibly beautiful out here. We woke up this morning to a very calm, still morning. It was very cold last night, but the wind died completely after a very windy uh, yesterday. And, uh, you know, the first thing we heard this morning was the birds chirping and then a couple coyotes talking to each other across this mountain pass here. And we get up and we get to watch the sunrise over the mountain. All we hear is quiet, the sounds of nature. And, uh, you know, Will and I were talking when we showed up a couple days ago and just talking about how the stress of life within industrial civilization starts to fall away when you get into a place like this, when you disconnect a little bit and start to connect with the land, uh, you know, connect with our, our roots, our relatives, our our, our ancestry, you know, which goes back, you know, no matter what lineage you come from, your ancestors were land-based peoples at some point. And so many of us, most of us have lost that real connection. So just being out here every day, being in touch with the weather, the cycles, the sunrise, the moon, uh, the moon is getting bigger right now and the stars are fading a little bit every night, but they're still incredibly bright Uh, dark, starry nights out here. Um, And then, you know, maybe most importantly, beyond the personal level, we're here because it's meaningful. And so we're hoping that people will come join us. Uh, You know, we're hoping people will come bring us supplies. If they're uh, only available for a short trip, just come stop by for a couple hours or a day or a weekend. And we're also hoping that people will join us for a longer-term occupation of this site. We don't know exactly when the mining company plans to dig. They are still waiting on a few permits from the state of Nevada, and we're going to be working to build opposition and pressure uh, to to try and deny them those permits. But, you know, our hope is that as we move further into spring and as the weather gets nicer, we can get more and more people out here to tell this mining company no, to say this place must be protected. So if people are interested in getting in touch with us or learning more about this project, Check out the website. You mentioned it already, but I'll say it one more time. ProtectThackerPath.org. And that's Thacker, T-H-A-C-K-E-R. And we're speaking with Max Wilbert, who is a writer, organizer, and wilderness guide in grassroots political work for nearly 20 years. And the, the book forthcoming, Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It, will be published this year by Monkfish. 
And um, you probably expected this next question. Today is Inauguration Day for the American government. And the turnover from uh, administration that just kind of rammed through a lot of, you know, you know, just wiped out a lot of environmental protection laws. Um, now we are into the seriousness now of a new, another change in administration. Is there and will there, or do you expect any change in at least, uh, you know, immediately to the mining? I know he's... Uh, Biden, Joe Biden, is going to nix the KXL pipeline, Keystone pipeline. But does that extend into the mining? Because the new world, the new horizon is lithium. What do you see is being prioritized here? Well, I really think, Jokison, that the destruction of the planet and the exploitation of the natural world is, is firmly bipartisan. Both of the political parties, you know, you could call them Democrats and Republicans, or you could say they're two different segments of the capitalist party, of the colonialist party. Um, they both rest firmly on a foundation of continuing extraction, continuing this American way of life, which is based on overconsumption, imperialism, military dominance of the world. Uh, interfering in other people's elections and other people's democratic processes around the world. Uh, so we're seeing a situation where Trump really fast-tracked this project. He and the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, under his management, under his uh, leadership, fast-tracked this project uh, over the opposition of local communities. And uh, Biden is likely to release some sort of plan to address climate change that we expect will rely almost entirely on lithium mining, on solar panels, on wind turbines, on these technologies which don't fundamentally address that human disconnection with the planet. They don't get to the root of the problem. There are these very superficial, quote unquote, solutions that aren't actually going to solve the fundamental issues that we're facing. And that's exactly why they're popular with those in power because it's profitable, because business as usual can continue with these green technologies. And just like we see on the Republican side, we see pandering to politicians from the, uh, pandering to donors from the fossil fuel industry. On the Democratic side, we see pandering to business interests who are involved in these sort of renewable energy technologies. And there's a lot of money to be made if you're willing to destroy the planet. And that's what we're here to fight against. We're here to say, you know, we need to completely change our ethical relationship and our framework uh, of how we relate to the natural world and to the, the rest of the life forms who, with, with whom we share this planet. And First Voices Radio is here to, and, and has always been understanding of, you know, even as you are paying attention to the earth, anyone who's there feels the land and, and why it must be protected. And, and you, you describe the scene of the birds and the sunshine and the land and sagebrush. And I've been to places where mining technologies have come in and just, you know, wrecked, wreaked havoc and destroyed any kind of ecosystem as gentle as it is in a desert. People think you have to be, yes, you have to be hardy to live out there, but the, the earth itself is very sensitive. And, and I know what you're doing. I, I I, you know, lift my hand up for you and thank you for, for your ideas and thoughts and for being there. And I want people to show up. And one more question before you go is uh, the bright green lies and how the environmental movement lost its way, what we can do about it. There seems to be the question, and yet we know that the environmental movement lost its way. And I could give many examples, but I just want your thoughts on how it lost its way and what, are, or what can the environmental do about it? Decades ago, if you asked people why they were part of the environmental movement, they often would have told you, I'm here to protect the forest. I'm here to protect the coral reefs. I'm here to protect the meadows and the grasslands. I'm here to protect the water. And often today in the mainstream environmental movement, you ask people why they're part of the movement, and they will tell you, I'm here to save civilization. I'm here to save this this society that we live in. And I think this is in many ways a, a consequence of the focus on global warming. 
which is a very serious problem. I don't mean to downplay the seriousness of global warming at all, but many people don't realize that global warming is a symptom of a much deeper problem that goes back much further into history. It's that, that human disconnection with the planet, that lack of harmony, that, that break with the natural world. You know, and, and, of course, I don't need to tell you and your listeners that we have seen thousands and thousands of examples of people all over the planet throughout human history living in a sustainable way, living in balance with the natural world around them. And so many environmentalists today are trying to save exactly that culture, which is the problem, that culture of civilization, which is the culture of living out of balance. Very well stated, Max Wilbur. Thank you again. And, and it's good to know that you're on the land and your feet are from that land, giving us the energy of that land. And I think it's really, as you say, as you maybe alluded to, but I would say to find peace with Earth will stop the wars and, you know, even the extraction corporations, because I think that's one thing that we haven't found is humans, at least those who have come over here after 1492. They've lost a piece with the earth, a relationship with it. And this is why we use the words connection all the time. And yet, the, you know, the birds and all the animals you see there have always been related because they know they are at peace with the earth, and that's contentment. So I'd like to thank you, Max, um, for being here, for bringing us. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon, okay? Thank you so much, Jokas, and I hope you all have a great day. We, we will, thank you. And this is First Voices of Radio. That is Max Wilbert, who is a writer, organizer, and wilderness guide, and a new book, Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It, which will be published this year by Monkfish, and you can also go find out. And if you really want to go out there, check the, the website out: protectthackerpass.org. Protectthackerpass.org. Thank you for joining us here on First Voices Radio. My name is Tiokus and Ghost Horse, and Doksha Ake Wachink Delo. This is after the Gold Rush.